views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. But they should be. We hope that they are your views as well, friends. Uh, the views expressed on this program are grounded in the truth of God's Word. We hope that you will study God's Word with us and find that what we're saying is indeed the truth. Glad you're with us tonight, and we're ready for a, a word from the Lord, and we're going to be discussing some things that uh, we didn't get to last week. So hope that you're ready to continue the study we had last week. Before we get started, we want to give you our contact information. A word from the Lord at gmail.com is how you can reach me by email or 276-340-2653, and I would be glad to hear from you. I've uh, been getting some calls from people that are way out of this area, and uh, I'm just I'm thrilled to hear hear from them. Uh, <clears throat> I've got a call from a guy in Canada uh, a couple weeks ago, a couple days ago. Got a, a call from a guy down in uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, and a very good to hear from the the particular gentleman that I talked to in Georgia. He actually has uh, learned the truth from watching this program or, or our programs on YouTube and so forth. And so re it really is encouraging to know that. What you're doing is making a difference not only just here, but also outside this area. It reminds me of what Paul said about the Thessalonians. He said that your, the, uh, uh, their, their faith was sounded abroad, and so that is, that's what we're trying to do, friends. We're trying just to give you the Word of God, and hopefully that as we sow the seed, that wherever it lands, it will produce uh, fruit from good and honest hearts that are trying to find the truth. And we cer certainly appreciate uh, you stud studying the Bible with us as you, uh, as you watch live or as you're watching on YouTube later on uh, uh, or DVD or however you might come across this program, we're very glad that you are watching. We hope that you will take us up on our invitation to come and visit with us or study God's Word with us in any, any time or any way you can. Uh, work, uh, um, a Muscle and a Shovel book, all our literatures are free. Uh, if you'd like a, a copy of A Muscle and a Shovel, it's a book that, that we're giving away free. Just give me a, a buzz or give me a call. Uh, you know, email or whatever, you can get in contact with me and we'll try to get one out to you just as quick as we can. So uh, we hope to do that. Hope that you will take us up on that offer. Uh, on, uh, let me just say this, on Sundays, if you're in the Eden area, if you're in this area, on Sundays we just begin a study of all the miracles in the Bible. And so we're going to be going through the miracles that, uh, that you find in, in, the, in the Bible, how God operated, what's the purpose of miracles, and what are actual miracles as opposed to things that people say today, you know, a baby being born or, you know, uh, uh, you know, a car accident, near missing a car accident, oh, it's a miracle. Well, is that really a miracle? What does the Bible have to say about a miracle? And let's see what the purpose of miracles were. So that's on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. If you'd like to study God's Word with us, uh, we're, we're studying that, uh, that subject. Uh, and we just started that Sunday, so you're not really... You're just getting in, into it if you come and visit with us on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m., 10 a.m. for worship at 250 the Boulevard there in Eden. <clears throat> Last week, we, we began with this uh, statement that was made by a member of the community who said, y'all are the only ones making any sense. And we began to go through some things as a result of that. We kind of used that as a springboard and began to uh, talk about some things that, that really make sense when you write and divide the word of truth as opposed to what men say when they come along and teach what they believe and they twist the scriptures, the scriptures of the Word of God to where they don't make any sense. And so when someone says, you are the only ones making sense, that then means, or the implication is, that other people aren't making any sense. And it's really, it's really not surprising, uh, folks, when you think about what people are saying, it's really not surprising that they don't make any sense. Because when you... When you try to insert man's ideas or man's doctrines, or you try, or man tries to uh, get something for himself, then from and by using God's word, he's always going to twist it to where it does not make sense. But friends, Paul said that when we read, we can understand the will of God, and so that 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 tells me that the Bible does make sense. But if something that is said or something that's taught that doesn't make sense, then it's not really coming from God's Word or it's not rightly dividing the Word of Truth. And, that, and that's why I'm saying, friends, when you're studying God's Word, if something doesn't make sense, it's probably something you're doing, not the Bible. Sometimes people say, well, the Bible just doesn't make sense. It's almost contradictions. No, 
The problem is in the way that it's being interpreted, the way that it's being, it's being handled, if you will. And so we are, are making sense because we do our very best to rightly divide the word of truth and make sure that everything we say is in agreement with the rest of the Bible. And so that's why the things that we're saying make sense. But people that don't make sense are the ones who say things like this. And so we're going to look at some more things that people say that just don't make sense. For example, let's start off with this. Let's start off with these preachers who talk about tithing. Let's just listen to this. If this church was a 100% tithing church, we would pay off every building project we would ever engage. And if we gave offerings, Ties were not designed for building. If this church was a hundred percent tithing church, we would pay off every building project we would ever engage. And ties were not designed for building. If this church was a hundred percent Tithing Are you hearing church. what you're saying, friends? We would pay off every building project we would ever engage, and ties were not designed for building. Now, why is he saying if 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 this was a hundred percent tithing church, if everybody in here was was tithing like they should, we would pay off every building project we ever engaged in. But ties are not for building. Now that doesn't make any sense, friends. Just forget the fact for a moment that tithing is not scriptural in the New Testament. All right? But here's a man that's going, well, if this was a 100% tithing church, we'd pay off every building project. But tithes are not for buildings. Then why are you using them for building projects then? See, friends, they're trying to get money from you, and so they put it to you like, well, if, this was a, if, you, were, if you were tithing like you should, look what we'd be able to accomplish and put you on a guilt trip to get you to give them your 10% and force you to do something that the Bible doesn't command you to do. Now, here's another, here's another call. This is Ask the Pastor. <clears throat> and listen to what these people say. I, I really like the first guy. The first, uh, the question, and then the first man that answers is pretty, it's almost humorous. Listen. Thank you, Pastors. Pastors, we have another gentleman on the phone, Greg from Eden. Greg, thank you for calling. Please ask your question, sir. Okay. Understand Greg is not there. Greg asked a similar question. Let's go ahead and answer that. But he says, where is tithing in the New Testament? Go ahead, Pastor Muldrow. Uh, Malachi chapter Malachi, Hebrew. 3. Hebrew. Oh, oh, the New Testament. I'm sorry. New Testament. It mentions in the Hebrews. It talks about uh, Jesus is a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. In the book of Hebrews, uh, one of the pastors want to find the exact scripture. Um, Melchizedek received the tithe from Abraham. But if you think about it, this was actually before the law was given. This is before the Ten Commandments were given. It's before Moses even hit the scene. So Jesus is a high priest in the order of that. So if Melchizedek received tithes, and that's one of the main things we know about. We don't know much, much else about him other than that. Jesus also receives your tithe. Tithing is an issue of returning to God what is his. All right, now... <laughs> That's funny. In the New Testament, well, Malachi 3, we know exactly where it is in Malachi. They know exactly where tithing is in Malachi because that's in the Old Testament, but we don't know exactly where it is in the New Testament because, well, we're not really familiar with the New Testament because we know that tithing is commanded in the Old Testament, but it's not commanded in the New Testament. Now, he tries to justify, he tries to justify tithing based upon the fact that, well, Abraham paid tithes to, to Melchizedek, and Melchizedek was before the law. Now, friends, I want you to listen to something. I want, I want you to notice something. Let's, let's go to this. Let's take our time. This is why, why we're making sense when it comes to things like tithing. In, in the book of... <coughs> sorry. In the book of uh, Galatians... I want you to notice what, uh, what Paul says. Now, this is going to be a... Uh, uh, I'm, and I'm trying to find here. Uh, 
on my Bible program. This is going to be a good way to help you understand what the Old Testament or what applies to the Old Testament. Now, Melchizedek is in the Old Testament. That's what the man said. But I want you to notice something. In Galatians chapter 4 and verse 21. Galatians 4 verse 21. Listen to what Paul says. He says, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law. Ye that desire to be under the law. Do ye not hear the law? He says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons. Now stop right there. See, that when you're rightly dividing the word, you'll understand this. Abraham is talked about in the book of Genesis. The same place you have Melchizedek. The same place you have Abraham paying tithes to Melchizedek. All right? But here Paul says that Abraham is talked about in the law. So even though you might say, well, this happened before the law of Moses, Genesis is included in the law. As a matter of fact, what are the first five books of the law? The law of Moses is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So when someone says, well, tithing took place even before the law of Moses, it's still part of the law that was done away with when Christ was nailed on the cross. It is still the old law. It's still part of the old law that was finished when, when Christ was nailed uh, to the tree. You see what I'm saying? So it doesn't matter what Melchizedek and Abraham did. They are still part of the law that Jesus finished. In, in uh, Colossians 2, verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, uh, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Christ nailed the Old Testament to the cross. He finished it. He fulfilled it. Okay? So we aren't under the old law today. Even Melchizedek and Abraham paying tithes to Melchizedek, we aren't under that. See, so the reason why tithing doesn't make sense today when these folks talk about it is because they don't know what the Bible actually says about it. The Bible actually says concerning it's giving, concerning giving, that you give as you purpose. You give as you purpose. Now watch this. Somebody says, well, you're supposed to tithe 10%. What does the Bible say? In 1 Corinthians 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, take your time here. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the church of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Now Paul says, here's the, here's the command. Upon the first day of the week, lay by in store. Now, let's just go ahead and lump this in about with tithing. When you, when you attend a, an assembly, a worship assembly, or a religious gathering, and they pass the chicken bucket on Wednesday or Thursday or Tuesday or Monday or Friday or Saturday, that is contrary to what the Bible says. Paul said on the first day of the week is when this takes place. Upon the first day of the week, this is the order that he gave. I have given order, that's a command, to the church of Galatia, even so do ye. So the command, the apostolic command, the command from the apostle Paul was to lay by store upon the first day of the week. Now, how much do you give? Paul just said as, you, as God has prospered you. That's right. But let's see how much you're to give. Is it a 10%? Is it 10%? 2 Corinthians chapter 9, <clears throat> notice this in verse 7. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart. Now friends, if the, if the preacher 
pastor, bishop, rabbi, whoever, tells you that you have to give 10%. You have to give. Even if he says you have to give 2%, 5%, 20%. If he says you have to give a certain amount, he's purposing for you. And God says, every man as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. You are to give as you determine, not as the preacher determines. And that's what a tithe is. If the preacher says you have to tithe, he's telling you how much to give. Now notice this. Not grudgingly. Now if you don't have very much and you have to give 10%, you know what? You might be a little grudging. You might be a little, you might be begrudging when you give this. Not grudgingly or of necessity. Well, I could play you a video clip of these of the, the, the panel of so-called pastors saying that, yeah, if you don't give to God, you're going to fail. Now, that's necessity. You, they're telling you you have to give in order for God to bless you. Now, you have to tithe. Excuse me, that you have to tithe in order for God to bless you. But it says, but God loves the, love the cheerful giver. Now, friends, here's, here's what the Bible is saying. The Bible is saying don't give it all. But the Bible says that the, the giver is the one who's in charge of how much they give. Now, it ought to be that if God has blessed you, you give cheerfully out of the abundance that you have. That you give cheerfully because you've been so richly blessed. Or somebody said, well, I don't have much today. You know what, friends? We live in a country that has the, the poorest person in America has more than the, than the richest person in some other countries, in a lot of countries. There are so many people in this country that are wealthy compared to what other countries have. I mean, you know, everybody's walking around with their free phone and they got a food card and they probably drive a car. They got air conditioning. They got cable. Boy, they got a lot of things compared to what some people don't have. Yeah, you're rich. You're blessed. So don't, don't, don't take me as saying God says you don't have to give it all. No, God says the, the order is to give. But it's the how that's what's confusing to a lot of people. When a preacher says you have to tithe, that just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense for the preacher to say you have to tithe when God says give as you purpose and give cheerfully and willingly as God has proffered you. That just doesn't make any sense. But when we, when we talk about what the Bible says, it makes sense. Now here's something else. When someone says, well, you have to tithe, who do you give it to? The Bible says in Hebrews 7, now I heard, you probably heard one of those preachers when the guy was running to Malachi and they said, oh, New Testament, New Testament, it's in Hebrews, in Hebrews. All right, somewhere in Hebrews. Well, in Hebrews 7 verse 5, how about read this verse? And verily they that are the sons of Levi who, have, who received the office of the priesthood have a commandment, now watch it, have a commandment to receive, to take tithes of, his bre uh, tithes of the people according to the law that is their brethren though they come out of the loins of Abraham. Only the sons of Levi have the commandment to take tithes of the people. Now, I can assure you there's not a pastor today that can prove that he's one of the sons of Levi. They can't prove that they're the sons of Levi. They can't, therefore, say that they have a commandment to take tithes of the people. And even if they could prove they were sons of Levi, they still don't have a commandment to take tithes of the people because the commandment that gave them the authority, the law has changed. The law that gave them the authority to tithe has changed. How do I know that? Let's come on down. Let's come on down. Hebrews, we're, this is Hebrews 7. But look at this in Hebrews 7 and in verse uh, 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further uh, need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not after the order of Aaron? Look at verse 12. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. The law changed in order that Christ 
could be a high priest. And the law that makes Christ high priest, that gives Christ the authority to be a high priest, is not the law of Moses. And therefore, it is not the law that says tithe of the people. It's done away with. It's changed. Now, friends, you just can't go back to the Old Testament and say, well, this is the law I'm going by. You just can't go back to that. And, and that's why it's so confusing. That's why people, it just doesn't make sense for people to say, uh, for a preacher to say, yeah, you have to tithe. All right? You have to tithe. Now, I want you to listen to what this lady says. After hearing a lesson on tithing, listen to what this caller said about tithing once she heard the truth rightly divided on the subject. At all, I am genuinely in wonderment as to why you think that one of them applies to you and the other does. Now, we have two callers that have just um, called on. James has taken one. I'm going to take the other. You're on what's the Bible study. Hi, how are you doing today? I'm great. Uh, I've always heard that we had to pay the 10%. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying makes sense to me, but I'd like to have the scriptures and stuff on that if I'm able to get it. Okay. If you can mail them to me. I'll tell you what, I'll mail you the whole tape. Okay, that's, that's, the, that's all this tape has been about all day long is, is what the Bible really says about tithing. Um, I'm going to say that James is going to get you on line four and get your address so you don't have to give it on the air. Okay. And we'll get that tape and I'm going to take number three. <clears throat> now, friends, just to show you. Now, did you hear the caller? She said it makes sense, but I'd like to have the, I'd like to have the scriptures so that she could look at her herself. That is, that is wonderful. That is, the, that is a wonderful call and a wonderful attitude. We don't want you taking our word for it. We want you to check it out. And you heard, you heard Johnny say, we'll get you the tape. You know what, friends? That was back when we were still making VHS tapes, and we made a bunch of VHS tapes and gave them out to people in Henry County and the surrounding area. So I believe, actually believe that lady lived over in Pennsylvania County. So, uh, uh, or close to it, uh, <clears throat> I don't know. Um, I know she lives out toward Brownsville area, but uh, nonetheless, we still make that offer to you today. If you want to hear this lesson again, ask for a DVD. Yeah, we're, we're, up, we're, up, we're upgraded now. We've gone from VHS to DVD. But my point is, friends, it's still free. It's still free. And so if it makes sense and you still want to check it out, you still want to examine it again, give us a call. Let us know. We'll get one out to you. But friends, the reason why it's making sense is because she heard the truth rightly divided. That's why it makes sense. You know what, you know what doesn't make sense? It's people that say, born in sin. Now listen to Tim Whitehart, Baptist preacher. It's not what you do, my friend, that matters so much. It's just the fact that when we were born, we were born sinners and that's our nature, and we come short no matter how much. Preacher, I just don't get it. I, I tell you, I'm not a sinner. I tell you, you are. And if you just said that, you just lied, so you sinned. There you go. My baby is three months old. I love her to death. And you know what I've said about that little three-month-old baby? My Alexandria, my a we call her Allie for short, but you know what I've said about her? I've looked in her eyes and I've said, you've got to be the most perfect angel that ever has been created. And you know, when I say that, I mean that, but you know, there's, there's a lot of untruth in what I just said. I mean, I love her. There's nothing wrong with that. And I'm not going to sit there and call her bad names or anything because she's my precious angel. But she's not perfect by any means. The Bible says, even though she appears that way, that we all are born to see her. You missed it. All right. Now, Tim Whitehart just called his three-month-old baby a sinner. Born in sin. Born in sin. Now, what makes someone a sinner? Well, listen to Dan Parker. Primitive Baptist. Not sin therefore reign. Now he's talking about the child of God. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body because of this, because that you are raised up above the law of sin and death. You still have the nature of sin. You still have the nature of sin. You still have the nature of sin, but you have the new man or the quickened man who can respond to spiritual things, who can respond to the gospel. And were by nature, see, those that were quickened were by nature in their depravity even as others. But, you know, if a, if a person which we believe when a person is born of God, 
He has a new nature. He is a new man. You still have the nature of sin. As we still have a sinful human nature whereby we have to contend with as God's children. All right, that sinful, that sinful nature, sinful nature, born in sin, sinful nature, sinful nature, that, that's, that's what folks say that we're born with. We're born with a, sin, a sinful nature. Now, I have a question, friends. I'm going to show you. I think this is going to illustrate pretty clearly why this doesn't make sense or how this doesn't make sense. The idea that we're born in sin. Now, I want to ask a couple questions. Number one, especially to you uh, Calvinist or Baptist who believe you're born in sin, is homosexuality a sin? Now, I'm just letting, I'm giving you time to think. Is homosexuality a sin? Now, you're probably saying yes. Go ahead and answer. Yes, it's a sin. It's a sin. Now, my next question is, are homosexuals born that way? Now, you're probably going, no, 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 you're not born that way. No, no, God didn't make them homosexual. No, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You just, you just said, and I said, we, you just heard Baptist preachers say, you're born in sin. You're born with a sinful nature. So, you are born sinners. Now, if you're born sinners, why then won't you let homosexuals say that they're born that way? You say they're born that way. Well, you say they're not born homosexuals, but you say they're born sinners. Now, so here's, what, here's what's confusing. So are you saying that they're born in sin, are born with a sinful nature, just not that sinful nature? Is that right? See how, see how crazy it is? When you have people going, well, we're born in sin. Yeah, we're born in sin. We got this sinful nature. We just, we just, we just can't help but sin. We start, we come out of the womb, we start lying. We sin and right when we're born. Yeah, before we can even talk, we're sinning. We're sinning, we're sinning. We're born sinners. Got a sinful nature, sinful nature. The homosexual comes along and says, well, I'm born that way. I'm born that way. Oh, no, you're not. You're not born that way. No, you're not born that way. Well, why not? You've been, you've been pounding everybody's head, born in sin, born in sin, born in sin. It really makes sense for someone to come along and say, well, I must be born homosexual then. I must be born a pedophile. I must be born a drug dealer, a drug user. I must be, I must be born all these things because you said I'm born in sin. Now, see, friends, it doesn't make sense for you to say born in sin and then turn around and say, no, you're not born that sin, with that sin. Maybe you should show us a scripture that says that you're not born with certain sinful natures. You know what? I bet you can find it. I bet you can find it right after the verse that says we're born in sin. But you can't find that either. See, friends, that's why that's confusing. There's a lot of people, good and honest people, who are thinking about what the preacher says about being born in sin. And they just can't accept that a person is born in sin, that a child is born a defiled, depraved sinner because they have had children die. Let me tell you, I think that's one thing that wakes people up the most. They hear the preacher pound, yeah, born in sin, born in sin, born in sin, and then they read about a child dying or they actually have one of their own child, children die, perish. And the preacher's words are ringing in their ears. Yeah, born in sin, sinners go to hell. Therefore, that child must go to hell. Nope. That doesn't make sense. You know why it doesn't make sense, friends? Because it's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. Now, if you said, if you, if you were to agree that homosexuals were born that way, that would make more sense given your teaching. But it still doesn't make sense according to the Bible. Here's why. Let's see what the Bible says. Let's make sense of it. Listen, Adam was made in the image of God. In, in Genesis 1, Genesis 1, 26, listen. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the, and over the cattle and over uh, every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. 
Now notice this in verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God was made, Adam was made in God's own image. Now, if we're born with a sinful nature and we inherit Adam's sin, we inherit that sinful nature, where did Adam get his sinful nature? See, friends, born in sin just does not make any sense. It does not make good sense to say we're born in sin Adam was made of God, yet he was not sinful, but yet now we inherit his sinful nature. He didn't have a sinful nature. When did he get his sinful nature? What? When did he get his sinful nature? Oh, he got his sinful nature when he sinned. Well, you just gave up born in sin. So you have a sinful, you, you start sinning, or you're a sinner when you begin sinning. See, Adam didn't have a sin nature. A child doesn't have a sin nature. A child's not born with a sinful nature, a depraved uh, desire to sin. Listen, you need to understand that God is not going to condemn someone who is, who is innocent, and children are innocent. So why would we say that they, that they have sin, all right? You on the word from the Lord? Yes, I wasn't able to catch Caleb's last name. Can you tell me, please? Caleb's last name, Robertson. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. All right, not what I expected, but glad to help. All right, <clears throat> so so how is it that we that we come to sin then. Look at this. In Romans 7, verse 9. Romans 7, verse 9. Paul says, For I was alive without the law once. Now how was Paul ever alive without the law? Was there, was at some point there no law? Well, we know there was a law. There was always a law. When Paul was born, there was a law. Without law, there is no sin. Romans 4.15. So we know there had to be a law for there to be a sin. But Paul says, I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. At some point in Paul's life, at some point in Paul's life, he was alive. He was alive. Spiritually alive. There was no sin imputed to him. And yet, at, then at some point, when the commandment came, when he realized he was accountable or amenable to the law of God, guess what? That is when sin revived. That's when it came alive. That's when he died. When he transgressed that commandment that he knew he was accountable, accountable to. Now, friends, that is as simple as you can get. That makes sense. It makes sense that a child can be born into this world sinless. That a child can grow. And even though a child may do things that we would say, well, that's a sin. Oh, he lied. Oh, yeah, he lied. His daddy, he, he told his daddy he didn't do it. Was it really a lie? If it was a lie, was it, account, was it held to his account? See, he wasn't accountable for it. If he was accountable for it and he doesn't repent of it, then if he dies, he's going to go to hell. And we, we can't have that. So why not just say the easiest thing, the simplest thing, and the thing that makes the most sense is at some point, God starts holding people accountable for their actions. I mean, we even do that in our society, friends. We even do that in our society. At some point, society says that a child is under the guardianship or under the uh, uh, the care of a parent or a guardian. And they are not accountable for what goes on. You hear about these kids going to, going to these parties and they're getting drunk and the people who get in trouble are the parents who provide the alcohol to the underage drinkers. Now, are they wrong? Yeah, but who's accountable? 
See, we understand the concept of holding some people accountable and other people not accountable. And so does God. God recognizes at some point, at some point, you are going to be held accountable to the command that he's given. But it's not when you're born. It's not when you're born. You don't want to write from wrong when you're born. See that? So, born in sin just doesn't make sense. Born in sin doesn't make sense. But what does make sense is knowing that God holds people accountable for their sin at a certain point. And that's when he starts imputing sin to their account. That's why David, that's why Paul said, he qu quoted David, but notice this. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. God doesn't impute sin to children. He doesn't put it to their account. Just like he doesn't put it to sin to the account of individuals who have obeyed the gospel and who continue to repent of their sins, confess their sins. Which brings us to our next point. Brings us to our next point. Here's something else that doesn't make sense. When people say once saved, always saved. Friends, this, this has got to be the most silliest doctrine I've ever heard. It's got, to, it's got to be the craziest thing I've ever heard. But listen to what, listen to what these preachers say. Here's Jerry, Dr. Jerry Carter. God, and he gives a whole list of things there that, that can't separate us from the things of God. Okay, so in, in, along those lines, let me ask you this then. <clears throat> so you're saying a child of God, a child of God, uh, is saved. They're they're not going to be lost. Never going to be lost. Never fall. Uh, what no, if, I didn't say they weren't going to fall. Cause okay. They real not going to be lost. Not, they're not going to be condemned to hell. Right. Okay. So if if someone who is saved then goes and commits fornication and dies in the very act, are they going to be in heaven? Well, would a saved man do that? Well, I believe so. I don't know if a <clears> saved <throat> man honestly would do that. Yeah. I mean. You know, would a saved well, man go out here and commit adultery? Would a saved well, man go out here and commit adultery? Would a saved well, man go out here and commit adultery? Would a saved man go out here and commit adultery? I don't know that a saved man would ever do that. Dr. Carter, have you never read about David? King David? A man of God's own heart? Not only did he go out and commit adultery, he murdered the woman's husband. You see the problem? Well, once saved, always say, well, I just don't know. I don't think a saved man would do that. Well, let me ask you this: Would a saved man, would a saved man lie? That's a sin, right? Would a saved man steal? Would it, would a saved man break the speed limit? Would, would a saved man curse? Would he would he drink, get drunk? Would a saved man uh, use drugs? See, the problem that, that Dr. Carter and these other folks are having is they're stuck on this once saved, always saved. So in order for it to make sense to them, they have to say saved people wouldn't do that. Well, I wonder if any of these preachers who profess this, do they ever sin? Are they, he must be sinlessly perfect then. Dr. Carter, are you saved? Oh, yeah, he'd say he's saved. He'd, he'd definitely say he's saved. Do you sin? Oh, yeah, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. Wait a minute. I don't think a saved man would do that. If a saved man, if a saved man wouldn't commit adultery, then what, what sin would a saved man do? Because obviously these, these guys say they're saved. Let's try to make sense of this. If a saved man would not sin, then either they're sinlessly perfect or either they're not saved. Which is it? Now, let's listen to what Dan Parker says. He commits sin uh, because he is a sinner. He commits sin uh, because he is a sinner. He commits sin uh, because he is a sinner. Now, friends, I can establish the fact that plenty of saved men committed sin. Plenty of saved men sinned. David is one of them. We just named that. 
David committed adultery, uh, committed murder. All right. Was he saved? Yes. Was he? Did he sin? Well, uh, uh, Dan Parker says, you sin because you're a sinner. You sin because you're a sinner. Well, what about Peter? In Galatians 2, Paul says that Peter, he rebuked Peter to his face because, watch this. <clears throat> when I saw that they walked not uprightly, according to the truth of the gospel, I said before Peter, I said unto Peter, before all of them, he rebuked Peter. He walked not uprightly according to the truth. He was sinning. Well, was Peter saved? Well, I think he was. I think everybody would say Peter was saved. Yet for some reason, some reason saved people, would, saved people don't sin. But yet we read in the Bible, saved people sinning all the time. Listen, if a saved person, if a person is saved from sin by the blood of Christ, why would you then call them, still call them a sinner? And if a person is once saved, always saved, why would you even worry about a person sinning? Why, why would a person even have to worry about sinning? Right? Anything they do would have, to, would have to, by default, not be a sin. They would have to be so protected, you know, that if they started to sin, they'd get a you know, bump and, nope, nope, we're not going to sin. You know, it's kind of like rolling the bowling ball down the bowling alley and you got those bumpers in the gutter. You, you, you start to go straight, boom, it puts you back in the track, boom. But we know that's not the case. Once saved, always saved doesn't make any sense. And it certainly doesn't make any sense for say, well, people sin because they're sinners. Well, which is it? Is it once saved, always saved, or do people sin because they're sinners? Listen, in 1 John 1 and verse 8, 1 John 1 and verse 8, John says, if you say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Whoop, sorry about that. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, let's stop there for a minute. If you remember what Tim Whitehart said in the video we played, he said, everybody sinned, and if you say you haven't sinned, you lied. Now wait, would a saved man lie? If a so-called saved man says that he hasn't sinned, he must not really have sinned, right? Because once saved, always saved. No one's going to say that. No one would agree to that. Everybody's going to say, oh, no, yeah, you sinned. You sinned. Okay, so really not once saved, always saved, right? Well, you sin, but you're just not going to be eternally lost. Well, which is it? Sin's going to enter heaven or not? Is it really once saved, always saved? Or is it once saved, always a sinner, and always saved? Maybe that's how you ought to say it. Or maybe there's a better way to say it. But basically you're saying if you're saved, you can still sin, but you won't be lost. So it's once saved, always a sinner. But John says if we say we have no sin, we lie. And then he says in verse 10, he said if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. You know why John could say this? John says this because he's talking about individuals who have obeyed the gospel. Now listen, John talks about individuals who sin. And yet he just got through saying to them, in this letter, back in verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. He just talked about having fellowship with God and then turns around and talks about people who sin. Why? Because you can be in fellowship with God and you can sin. It's possible that you're sin, that you'll sin. 
Look what he goes on to say in chapter 2. He said, My little children, these things write unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. See, God knows that even when you obey the gospel, you may sin from time to time. But the difference, that doesn't make you a sinner. That doesn't make you a sinner. It just makes you a child of God that sins. But it doesn't make you a sinner. Not an alien sinner. Paul said in Romans 6 verse 12, we're talking about not letting, the, not letting sin reign in, in your mortal body. Romans 6 and verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey it in lust thereof. We live in a fleshly body. We're going to sin. But not letting it reign is the key. But now, what if a person lets sin reign in their life? Will they be lost? Yes, they can be lost. They could very well be lost if they don't repent of that sin. But see, the problem that people have when they say once saved, always saved, and they get stuck on this, this uh, born in sin nature, is they start confusing, they start confusing what the Bible actually says. Listen again what Dan Parker said about this, about being a child of God and the nature that you still have. You know, if a, if a person, which we believe when a person is born of God, he has a new nature, he is a new man, but he still has sin dwelling in him. The remedy is stronger uh, than uh, the disease. All right, listen, listen to that one more time. Listen to that first part, you know, especially. If a, if a person, which we believe when a person is born of God, he has a new nature, he is a new man but he still has sin dwelling in him. The remedy is stronger uh, than uh, the disease. All right, if a man is born of God, he has a new nature, but he still has sin in him. He still has that old nature. He still has that old man of sin, that old nature of sin. Well, which is it? Do you have a new nature or do you not have a new nature? He says the remedy is stronger than the disease. The, 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 the cure is stronger than the curse. But he turns around and says that even though you're cured, you still have the curse. That just doesn't make any sense, friends. That just doesn't make any kind of sense. Listen, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in, in Christ, he's a new creature. What part of new do you not understand? He's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Well, all things except that pesky old sinful nature. It's not new. It's still there with you. Maybe Paul should have put it that way. I'm sure Paul just left that out because he didn't know once saved, always saved, and born in sin. He didn't know that, those crazy doctrines. <clears throat> all things have become new except that old man of sin. It's still there. You're a child of God with a new creature, a new nature, except for that old man of sin, that sin nature. See how ridiculous that is, friends? That's ignorance going to seed. But it's all because people are trying to put a doctrine of man in the Bible where it doesn't belong, where, where it doesn't fit, where it doesn't fit at all. All right, we'll get one more here. One more here. Sinner's prayer. Sinner's prayer. Just like me, yeah. they won't go into a church, brother, uh -huh. to get saved. Yeah. But they can sit there in, the, in front of the TV mm -hmm. set and conviction fall yeah. upon them. It's and they'll get right down on their yeah. hands and knees. And when somebody leaves a sinner's on. prayer, yeah. they can sit right along with them and find exactly Jesus right. Christ as their Lord and Hallelujah. Savior. Uh, every once in a while, I, I catch your show. And I know that you guys uh, usually help people out with a sinner's prayer. Mm-hmm. And I try as much as I can to read my Bible, and I haven't ran across the sinner's prayer in there yet. Well, there's not nothing that you can call a sinner's prayer in the Bible. But by being on the air like this, we uh, were able uh, every yeah. Saturday night. That's right. Someone, 
someone offers the sinner's a sinner's prayer. Well, there's not nothing that you can call a sinner's prayer in the Bible. But by being on the air like this, we uh, were able uh, every Saturday night. That's right. Someone, someone offers the sinner's a sinner's prayer. Well, there's not nothing that you can call a sinner's prayer in the Bible. All right, every night somebody offers a sinner's prayer, but there's not one in the Bible. Now, friends, really? If you're a blind man, you can see through that. That doesn't make any kind of sense. That doesn't make any kind of sense. We're going to offer you, lead you into saying the sinner's prayer that's not in the Bible, and then convince you that you're saved even though you did something that's not in the Bible. Friends, why would anybody, why would anybody say something that's not in the Bible and believe that they actually have done what God says when God never said anything about it. You see what we're talking about? The sinner's prayer is not in the Bible for a reason. It's not truth. Listen, here's why this is confusing. Again, nobody went through and consulted the Bible when they made up these doctrines. In John 9, verse 31... John chapter 9, verse 31. Listen to what, what the record says. John 9, 31. We're talking about the blind man <clears throat> who's been healed. And they called Jesus a sinner. And he said, now we know, but he says, now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Now why would he say that? Why would the blind man say, we know God does not hear sinners? Because he knew what the Bible says. He knew Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your sin, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. The psalmist said in Psalm 34 that the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And Peter quotes that in 1 Peter 3 and verse 12. Now, God does not hear, he does not heed a sinner's prayer. Why would God heed and forgive someone who is an alien sinner who has not obeyed him in order to receive the forgiveness of sins that comes through the shedding of his blood, of his son's blood. Why would you expect God to forgive you? He's not, he's not listening to you. You haven't even obeyed him to start with. You haven't even gotten to a position to where he will hear you. You haven't even gotten to a position to where you are in a covenant relationship with him and therefore he can't hear you. He won't hear you. So when we talk about the sinner's prayer and we offer $1,000 to anyone who can produce a sinner's prayer, friends, we're talking about the sinner's prayer for an alien sinner, someone who's outside a covenant relationship with God. Uh, uh, Ephesians 2 and verse 12, this is what we're talking about. Someone who's outside, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the... Uh, covenants of promises, having no hope and without God in the world. That's what we're talking about. Individuals who are outside of Christ, strangers from God. Why would God hear their prayers? That's why there's not a sinner's prayer in the Bible. God is not going to forgive their sins because they haven't done what God has said do in order to obtain forgiveness of sins from their, forgiveness from their past sins. Now, if you obey the gospel... If you obey the gospel, then you have access to God and he will forgive your sins. Then you, can, then you can pray. But telling people to say a sinner's prayer and not even know where it is in the Bible or even know, even worse, know that it's not in the Bible doesn't make any kind of sense. But friends, here's what does make sense. Here's what does make sense. The Bible clearly says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11 verse 6. Well, how do you get faith? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. All right? Now, this is making sense. You have to hear the word of God that produces faith. 
This word's going to tell you about Jesus Christ and the Son. He's the Son of God. John eight twenty four. Jesus said, "If you believe not that I'm He, you'll die in your sins." So you hear the word of you hear the word of faith, and you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now the word also tells you you need to repent of your sins. Acts seventeen verse thirty. Paul said, "God commands all men everywhere to repent." So you had to repent, and then you had to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Acts eight and verse thirty seven. The eunuch said, "I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God." And so he made the confession of what he believed. Again, he heard it. He believed. Now he's repenting. And one act of repentance is to make that confession. Now, what's the next step? He said, what doth hinder me to be baptized? He obviously knew that he needed to be baptized. And so, once he had done these things, he was baptized for the remission of sins. Acts 2, 30, Acts 2 38. Repent and be baptized, everyone in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Now, friends, this makes sense. It makes sense that God would respond by forgiving your sins when you obey Him because He became the author of salvation to all who will obey, Hebrews 9, 5 and verse 9. Now, friends, that makes sense. It makes sense that now God hears your prayers and now you're in a relationship with God where you can ask Him to forgive your sins. Friends, we're the only ones making sense. And if we're the only ones making sense, this is how I close last time. If we're the only ones making sense, why... Are you not with us? It just doesn't make sense for you to say, you're all right, you're teaching the truth, but we're not with you. Friends, we want you to be with us. We want you to have a relationship with God. We want you to be a member of the Lord's Church, the Church of Christ, the only church you read about in this book. If we can assist you in any way, we want to do that very thing. Until next time, here's our content information. Always make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night.